Hello, everybody. It is Brian, and I'm kind of here by myself this week. Um, Miss Miss Berlin is feeling under the weather. Mr. Betcher has a family commitment that uh, he needs to be at. So um, this is Break Sec Education. Uh, glad you're all here joining me here on, on a Sunday night. I have a guest, a uh, guest you may have seen before if you're or listened to if you're an avid podcast listener. Uh, Jared Freitas, welcome. Hey, Brian. It's good to see Excellent. you. Excellent. Yes. All right. So um, we, fig- we figured the audio thing out, which is great. Um, so uh, for, for, for those folks that uh, haven't seen Jared in the flesh and have only heard him, there's a name to a face uh, and a voice to a face. So uh, I think I want to say the last time we had you on was about three years ago. You know, I think something, you said three years ago. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Break Sec Podcast, Jared Freitas. I should have looked this up, but yeah, 2016. Steps when scheduling a pen test. Yeah, 26, uh, 2016, episode 29. Yeah. Um, that's almost seven years ago. No, wait, we got, no, 2018. No, were... Okay, 2018. Oh, wow. Okay. Further back yeah, than I thought. Yeah, so it's been closer than four years. Yeah, yeah. But, um... Uh, a lot has changed in the past four years uh, since well, almost six years now with 2018. But yeah, um, cool. Um, glad uh, glad we were able to get you on and uh, be able to uh, talk about some threat modeling stuff tonight. I wanna I wanna preface this by saying we don't we tr- we're not gonna make this boring. This is definitely something you can in- immediately take back to your workplace t- t- tomorrow uh, and or today if you're watching it or listening to it, and uh, and start working through these things. Um, I, I think the only... Um, I think the only resistance you will get is where you might fit it into your processes or if you don't have any processes. So um, uh, before we all get into that, I want to let Jared introduce himself again to, to people who might be new and uh, you know talk about his journey from... Um, you know, where I met him at Xerox a long time ago, long time ago, uh, <laughs> and to now and what, and what, what you do. So go ahead, Jared, take it away. Yeah. So, um, my name is Jared Freitas. I've been in it various things now for, uh, 30 years, actually, uh, this year I have done everything. I have done service desk. I have done uh, printer tech. I have done server admin, network admin, security stuff. Uh, I, I just, I've been all over the place within the field. Um, it's, uh, it's actually been 20 years, uh, and a couple of weeks, uh, since I got into security formally, spent about nine years on defense and, uh, got an opportunity to go on offense and, uh, took that, which is where I met you and Mr. Betcher. Oh, yeah. And yep. uh, uh, got some good food around Austin, and um, uh, been bouncing around in the offense side for a little while, doing uh, pen testing, web app stuff. Um, and uh, one of the things that doesn't get a whole lot of attention: uh, architecture reviews. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, you've also had a, a little, uh, you've worked with uh, a good friend of ours, Jay Beal, uh, over at Guardians. Mm-hmm. You've done um, uh, quite a bit of work in this space. Uh, and yeah, you know, architecture review. So, all right, let's 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 do a little bit of, you know, definitions here. An architecture review for you means what? Because it may be different for me or for, for the person who's listening, right? Right, so... Architecture reviews, I found, don't have a really solid definition. Um, Most people that I've run across, they think of things uh, that are more along the lines of configuration reviews. Uh, Pull open Mm -hmm. the firewalls, you pull open the routers and switches, um, you see how they're configured. Um, You know, you look at uh, some sample workstations and servers and see how they're configured. PCI uh, encourages this kind of thing, for example. Um, and that's part of it, but the, the way that I was taught to do architecture reviews, um, is from a more broad perspective of, you're not just looking at individual components, you're looking at the entire system that is the environment. You're looking at data flows, you're looking at, um, the 
the policies and the processes of how everything works, or at least how it's supposed to work. Um, and then you dive down and you find out how it actually does work. And um, these, anybody who's been in IT for any reasonable length knows that these are often uh, very different. Uh, right. And there, there are really some surprising things out there uh, that can come up. Um, we can we can delve into them a little bit later, but um, there are there are things that look good on paper, but once you actually sit down with the people that are supposed to be putting it into play, they will let you know this stuff doesn't work, and here's why it doesn't work, and here's all the ways that we've had to work around it just to get operations to to stay up. And um, so when I'm doing uh, when I'm doing an architecture review, I'm kind of going through that and figuring out, okay, what's the path to get the paperwork and what's going on in the trenches to line up and, and have everybody working towards a, a safer environment. Right. Right. So <clears throat> a lot of people out there are probably, um, you know, they, I, I, I kind of self indulge, indulge myself, Jared said, Hey, you know, let's, let's talk about something. And I was like, Hey, you know, let's talk about security reviews. Let's talk about security architecture and those things for, for us, where I work, um, fairly well-known company, we have specific guidelines, uh, mm -hmm. oh, uh, huh. Okay. So. There we go. Give that a shot. The YouTube one, uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, there it goes. Hello, there it is. All right. So I'll have to upload the VOD later. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for uh, letting me know. Uh, you, we have a we have a fan on the YouTube channel, so that's that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, thank you, Catherine, for that. Um, yeah, we'll upload the full VOD. We, we've only missed a few things, so I appreciate that. Um, so for, for me, yeah, I'm a bit self-indulgent. We have architecture reviews. Um, we also have uh, when product people come in, there is usually somebody from the security team involved in the initial discussions of what a product is. Um, I, I don't know, Jared, if you actually are um, involved in that process coming from a consultancy. I mean, at what point do you come into... Uh, the engagement or the, you know, the, the company, are you brought in at the beginning or are you brought in after say, you know, most devices have a anywhere between 18 month development timeline. So are you brought in like month 16 where it's like really hard to make changes once you go, Oh, this is hot garbage. You should probably fix it. Where, where do you come in at? <clears throat> so it can be all over the place. Uh, usually it's not at the beginning of things. Usually it's um, after people or, or after a company has, uh, grown out a bit and they've looked at things and they realize that they don't have a good grasp of where things are um, or where they should be in many cases. And they're looking for advice and they're, they're worried about a, a couple of major things. One is they're worried about nation states. Right. And they are worried about uh, whether all their blinky lights are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, when I come in, I try to come in at a different level. And the first thing is to figure out, are you are you even doing anything that's close to best practices? Um, right. And I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm sure some people that are listening in uh, are kind of rolling their eyes at the nation state thing because everybody's worried about nation states. But, you know, as as everybody knows, if you're worried about that, but you're not worried about the script kitties, your priorities are a bit off. Right. Um, and so ideally, if you don't know what your goal needs to be, that's where an architecture review really comes in. Um, you can use that to help figure out what your priorities are going to be. Um, you never had a pen test, get an architecture review first, because mm -hmm. that'll help you to figure out not just what to go after, but where to, where your pen testers need to start from. Um, if you've had a pen test, great. If it's at all possible, let the person doing the architecture review see it. Um, that can help to 
maybe find some of the places that haven't been uh, that, that haven't had too close a look. Um, another thing that I've run into is is clients that are trying to shoot way too high. Um, so for a long time, uh, there were terms like SP 800-53 and uh, SP 800-171 that you really only knew about if you were doing deep dive in uh, compliance. And a lot of it was sort of government-ish compliance stuff. And, um, but these are, these are tomes. I mean, each one is like 500 pages long. Um, and if, if you don't know what your network looks like, that's not the right place to be starting. Um, and, and NIST has helped out, uh, with the cybersecurity framework. Um, I've been seeing a ton of interest, um, in the cybersecurity framework, uh, but it's still some work to get there and it's, often better to start focusing on is your network segmented um do you have basic password controls in place do you know who's actually on your network and and what they're allowed to get to um those kind of things will feed into what can become cybersecurity framework uh, csf um right. or some of the other things that are out there uh but you need to have a little more grounded starting point on things um an architecture review can help out at any point, but like anything, the earlier you bring security in on it, the the better, uh, easier, and frankly, less expensive the result is going to be. Right. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to use the term shift left. I think that's probably been over overdone. And um, but what I what I love to understand is if you know what do you look for when you're you know let's say you you come in. You look at the architecture diagrams. What what kind of things are you looking? Are there different types of architecture diagrams that are better for figuring out the scope of things? I'm um, my my friend Doctor Doctor Cowan, who I'll, I'll tell him I give him a shout out here. He had a specific way of doing architecture diagrams where he was showing things like where auth boundaries are and where um, you know. Uh, data flow goes through an auth boundary, or maybe it doesn't go through an auth boundary, or um, you know, being able to explain, okay, you know, this web application is going to send data to this database, and this database automatically trusts everything that comes from this application. So there's no, you know, there's no authorization there. Or how does how specific do you want to get with? an architecture diagram? I mean, obviously there's the ten thousand foot level where it's like, oh, you have a user. You go to a web page, you type a bunch of stuff in, and it goes into a block over here that is a database or a Redis or something. How, how deep are you expecting there? I mean, is it? Are you about to tell me it depends, or is there a you know is there is there a good happy medium? I'd like to start with actually having a diagram. Um, okay, that's a good start. Okay, uh, and okay. that is often lacking. Um, Usually when I ask for a network diagram, what I get are the cabling diagrams, which they're, <laughs> they're useful. They're useful in some contexts. Um, you know, it, it, that's going to tell me, OK, yes, your your switches and your routers and your firewalls are all properly wired up for redundancy. And great, right. you have whichever protocol is running. Great. OK, that's that's all useful information. But what I need to know is where is the data going? Right. Where is it not going? Um, stuff like that. And a lot of places simply do not have that kind of diagram. They don't, they don't, they, if you sit down and you actually talk with them, they can tell you where all the data is going, or right. at least where it's supposed to be going. Um, but in many cases, they don't have it. I mean, I'm going to start off by sending a list of questions. Um, and a lot of it is, is document requests. So, I want to see your network diagrams. I want to see your firewall rules, your uh, switch and router ACLs, um, your policies and procedures. It, basically, it's it's a big document dump. Mm -hmm. And if there's a document you don't have, that's fine. It, yes, it's a finding, but it's something that can be fixed. But I find that the lack of a network diagram can lead to a lot of misunderstanding and confusion. And it's frustrating to me from a couple of levels. Um, one, because I was kind of brought up relying on data flow diagrams. Right. Um, but um, so 
you know, without that, it's I, I, I have to dig more and to to work on things. But it's also um, it's frustrating. It's, uh, so yeah, it, it's frustrating from a sort of historical. My own, you know, I, I can't see what's going on, but it's also frustrating because I now have to spend time on figuring all of that out. That is time that is potentially taken away from other aspects, where mm -hmm. I'm figuring out something that is really fundamental, um, that should probably be there. And you know, if if I gotta find if I gotta you note know, corrections on it, fine. But um, right, having to build it from scratch is is really difficult. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. I, I would imagine if they haven't built an architecture diagram, and and, and maybe maybe we're just I don't want to say splitting hairs, but we're using different. You know, they gave you, you you asked for an architecture diagram. They gave you router ports and you know cabling guides and everything like that. Is there a better is there is there a better term for that that they might understand? It's like your your process flow diagram or your debt. We've we've I, sometimes used data flow diagrams or something like that. But I mean, is is it better to say you know we're looking for a data architecture review or a process architecture review or something like that instead of a security architecture review? So those can those can be part of it, um, or those can be separate. Uh, when I'm doing the security architecture review, I'm not so much focused on um, I'm not so much focused on what the data is doing more uh, as much as I am um, focused on where it's going and where it's not going, um, mm -hmm. and ensuring that the boundaries are there. Um, I to to some degree, I don't care what your application is doing. I just care that the data is staying in whatever silos it's supposed to be staying in. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I'm. I don't get into I don't get very deep into development practices. I do get into things like, um, you know, are you <clears throat> excuse me, are you um, you know, do you have a, a um, and now the acronym is escaping me. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, do you have um, your standards documented? Uh, your do you have specific languages documented versions? Um, do you have your um, do you have your code practices all documented? Um, right. what the code is actually doing, I'm not usually intimately, uh, involved in that part of things. Um, there are some process pieces that I will get involved in, uh, which is where the policies and procedures come into play because, um, knowing how the people are interacting with the technology is critical for understanding how the data is being managed and, uh, what the potential is for that data to start wandering out of places that it's supposed to be right right <clears throat> okay so let's let's say they gave you a diagram um when you're when you're first going through it there must be some some gotchas that you see immediately what are i mean you, you've done this more than a few times i'd imagine so what are mm -hmm. what are some of the first things you see when you're you're looking at a typical diagram you're like ah there's you know not not just where, where the data is located because i mean that you kind of build your, your the idea is you're building your security architecture around the things that you need to protect which is usually the data but are there are there things that you immediately see when they're you know doing that is it like a non-standard format i mean is it you know, what 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 are some of the things you typically see there? Uh, errors that you're like you can point out immediately and go, ah, you're not doing this or you're not doing this. So the main thing is not segmenting the networks, um, and it's not just keeping HR from talking to finance, although that's part of it. Um, it's also uh, it's also isolating the server architectures. Um, there really is not, in most cases, a really good reason um, for your uh, for your domain controllers to be sitting on the same network as as your databases. Yes, they need to talk. No, they don't need they don't need to be on the same layer two fabric. Um, keep them apart from each other, um, and uh, open up the ports that are necessary, and close off everything else. And uh, that's uh, ninety plus percent of the first uh, of what I spot first time, because um, everybody's they just they put all their servers in the same subnet because it's easy and they isolate it off so that IT can access the admin stuff. But the problem is, is that you've got web ports and database ports open to various uh, 
various subnets and somebody gets in there and now they've got full access inside. And oftentimes there's not a whole lot in the way of, uh, there's not a whole lot in the way of um, alerting on traffic that shouldn't be there. Um, another mm. thing is relying on switch ACLs. Uh, yes, you can set up ACLs to block traffic. It's appropriate in some, uh, um, it, it, it's appropriate in for some environments, but in most cases, I really do like to see an actual firewall that's logging the traffic uh, and that is capable of alerting when something is trying to go in a direction that it's not supposed to be going. Um, it is a bit more expensive to set that all up. Um, it does take a little bit more work to understand what the data flows are, but it's also a massive reduction in the overall threat surfaces. Um, right. You know, if, right. If the only port that's open, uh, with the exception of, of the uh, domain controllers, but you know, if the only if the only port that's open to anything uh, on a database server is the actual database port, you have really shrunk down the potential threat surface. And then that that uh, server probably should only be accessible from uh, the web application or whatever whatever application that needs to talk to it. Um, and then ideally a jump network, but if not that, then it, you know the IT group or the dev uh, the database devs uh, that can get access to it. And um, yeah, you can do that with switch ACLs. That tends to be more difficult because you're keeping track of a lot of stuff in a lot of different places. Um, you're not getting much or anything in the way of logging. And uh, so you end up with this blind spot that you don't even realize is there. Right. So so we've you've highlighted a couple of risks, it sounds like. You know, the, the network segmentation means that it's easier, you know, the lack of network segmentation in this case. It, it makes it easier for somebody to do something like lateral movement through your network. If somebody was to gain access through your database, because we know that there's no vulnerabilities in databases that could you know, cause you to any issues. Um, there's uh, lack of logging, which is a another whole thing that you know probably should go in there at some point in your architecture diagrams. Like, okay, all the logs are going to go someplace. Is it a Splunk? Is it in a different you know s network? Are you logging at all? Who's going to have access to those? Um, do you look for things like you know? I I don't know. I don't know if you've ever seen documents that show you things like who has access to those systems or anything like that. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, see if there's any kind of standardization that you look for, you suggest, and you're like, okay, yeah, this document is great, but you're missing a handful of things that would really make it easier for me, the potential pen tester, or me, the, you know, the, the system architect to look at. And, you know, you've got a test, you got a pen test coming up in a couple of weeks and, you know, uh, you you could have used that or had that ability. So, are there any other things that you you know would suggest there in in terms of documentation uh, for you know scope purposes or for you know informing people? Because you know sometimes we don't ask the right questions and we miss things. Yeah, the, uh, I'll I will often ask for some technical information to be included. Um, I can run it if necessary. Uh, when I'm doing architecture reviews, I try to try not to do a whole lot of technical touching. Um, the uh, but I'll I'll ask them to run Bloodhound. Have you know one of their domain admin accounts run Bloodhound uh, and mm -hmm. get that over to me securely. Um, if they have uh, you know, if whatever their latest uh, vulnerability scan results are, um, depending on the environment, maybe an Nmap scan. Uh, if they don't really have a good idea of what their network looks like. Um, you know, the, the tools will vary. Uh, the, the requests will vary a bit and the tools will vary a bit. But um, yeah, Bloodhound, is, I think, is probably the most common one. If they're running, uh, if they're running Linux or BSD um, or some other non-Bloodhound uh, friendly architecture, uh, then I will ask for config dumps. Um, and I'm used to I'm used to going through config dumps. Um, I've right. seen, uh, yeah, I, I've had the, uh, I've had database server configs provided. Um, you know, uh, taking a step back, I've I had router and switch configs provided that have literally uh, hundreds or even thousands of ACLs, and parsing through that is a bit of a challenge. Um, 
even even when you have tools to help you figure out what those look like. Um, yeah, typically, I'm getting if if a client is fairly well it has things fairly well documented i'm probably getting in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 documents pretty easily um wow. if not if not i may still end up getting 50 or 60 documents to go through um uh when you start including the configuration dumps so there there can be a lot there can be a whole lot uh to go through but um uh, Everything that they provide is useful information and everything that they don't provide is useful information. Right. So I, uh, how difficult do you find it is to get things like cloud configured, you know, the AWS or the Googles of the world or the Azures, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, you have them run something like Scout Suite or, you know, to, to look for, you know, you're not just configure because you're looking for configuration issues with Scout Suite, but there's also other things that you can find with that tool um, uh, or, you know, Paku or something else like that. Um, do you, do you find that those are useful um, or are they just like, they, these are house key, these are house cleaning or hygiene things that you should be doing automatically. So if you're not doing them now, you know, start doing them yeah I, I find that either that either there's a lot of documentation on how the on how the cloud system works or how the cloud architecture works or there's absolutely nothing there's really not anything in between um and the various reporting tools that are out there can help um a lot of times they end up telling me kind of what i already know they can help to, to provide some direction certainly um but uh they can yeah you know, it, it if they tell me, well, we don't have time to get you the cloud configuration, so we're just going to give you a, an account, and you can log in and look for yourself. Oof. That's that is frighteningly common. Wow. Um, that's that's some trust right there, you know. Uh, well, they're they're already handing over their firewall and 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 configs and and their bloodhound stuff, so at, sure. I'm hoping okay. that they trust me with it. That's um, true. Uh, and, and I do ask for read-only accounts. I, I don't want something ah, in there okay. because uh, not only do I not only do I not need that access, I don't want it. You know, exactly. and I try to run a tight ship myself. But the the less risk there is of somebody getting to your systems through my systems, the better. Right. Um. And uh, but it's yeah, it, it's just there really is not much in the way in between. Um, what's often happening for those that don't have any documentation at all and are, and are willing to just give me the access um, is that they are so busy fighting fires that most of the rest of their architecture review um, is also going to have, is also going to be working on identifying the gaps. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> and, and that can be, that can be really rough uh, because I really do like to find the things that they're doing well. If you're doing right. something well, I'm going to call it out, not only to give you a pat on the back, but to let whoever in management is reading the thing to know, uh, letting them know there are good things that are coming out of this. Um, you know, very rarely do I go into a place uh, that has a lot of problems and not find at least one thing that they're doing well. Some little pet project that somebody put together that locked down some corner of the network really well, and maybe it can be expanded. Right. Um, but, um, you know, and I also try to be understanding of what's going on. Um, if, you know, locking down just a regular office that's selling widgets, uh, that's one thing. Locking down, for example, um, a hospital, that's hard. Right. That is right. because you are literally dealing with people's lives there. And, you know, when I go in and say, well, the best thing that you can do to reduce the overall threat profiles is to start isolating the networks, you know, doing your network segmentation. They start backing up uh, because <clears throat> what's going through their head is the alerts aren't coming off of the various systems and landing on the nurses stations. Um, right. You know, and I'm looking at a more of like, you know, does HR really need access to the IVs? Probably not. Right, right. Um, right. But the path to get there, it, you you have to be understanding uh, going into this. And um, I mean, I've I've worked in financial 
uh, I've worked with financial clients. I've worked with medical clients. I've worked with, um, uh, I've worked with power stations. Um, they all have their own challenges and they all have their own sort of panic moment when bringing up some of these things. And, um, I would love to be able to hand them a magic wand and say, you know, just do this. Right. But I realize that a lot of the stuff that they're going to be doing is a multi-phase and may take several years. Um, I, I There was one person that I talked to, it was, was not a client, but it was uh, <clears throat> somebody I was talking to at a conference about it. And um, it was a, a hospital. And they liked the idea of segmenting the network and, and like isolating all these different parts of what goes on, even on the medical side of things. And they were like, that's a decade long project. Right. And yeah, it, it, it absolutely can be because of all the testing you have to do and all the monitoring and all the data collection that you have to do before you can be certain that when you actually close off those two networks, that you're not going to kill somebody. Right. Um, so, so, okay. I, I, I will, I will. So there have been a lot of hospitals in the news forever and will continue to be because they're yeah. hospitals. Um, Hospitals don't see IT as important, apparently, or they do, and they just have no way of fixing it. Because uh, my my thought is they're not going to care about the IT department until they treat it the same as their as their patients. They they have certain priorities that are not in line with what. A lot of IT security people consider to be important. The, the and and this is this is a running problem. You get management is concerned about one thing, and you have the people in the trenches that are concerned about a very different thing, and you can't get the two of them to talk to each other. Um, right. and, and that's actually one of the things that I like about the uh, about what I do is management is is paying. You know, they're writing a check for somebody on the outside. They want to listen, and um, so uh, and then. You know the people are um, the the sysadmins and so forth. Uh, they want the outside perspective of things. Of you know how can they do their job easier? How can they get their message across better? Stuff like that. And so they're willing to listen. And so now I have two uh, I have two audiences that are open to listening to somebody, and maybe I can get the two of them to start talking a little bit. Right. Um, and. The, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I like to think that I've at least opened a door once I've left uh, and, and gotten yeah. them talking. Um, I come back later on sometimes and I find out that very little has changed because the two of them still can't agree on on, on priorities. But yeah. um, I, I think in most cases, uh, in most cases, the the reviews do help to get maybe not getting everybody on the same page, but at least drawing them a little bit closer and maybe helping them to understand each side's different priorities. Yeah. my So I posted a link up in our chat, both of them, the, the YouTube and the Twitch stream, about Lurie Children's Hospital that's been offline for two weeks. Uh, well, they were, off, they were offline for two weeks. I'm actually trying to find out if they've had any updates from that, but they got hit with ransomware. And for two weeks, they've been doing everything with paper because... Everything got owned up, and um, my my my. This should scare the hell out of every hospital administrator in the country to go. Maybe maybe we should do something about our IT networks, but we know that's not going to happen. You know, my my thought is they're like, oh, thank God it wasn't us. We can continue acting like nothing's gone wrong, until it's them, or until it's another hospital in the Chicago area, or you know, another children's hospital somewhere else. If hospitals aren't going to change after so many ransomware attacks that have already occurred, do you, what kind of uh, you you go in and you do reviews and you do security architecture reviews and you you bring to light these issues and then you go back and you said yourself very little happens because they can't figure out how to work together. Um, do you have any, I don't want to say any control, but do you have any way of, you know, follow-up work or are you, are, are you, you know, 
hiring yourself out as a security PM to go, okay, I'm going to manage helping you through the changes in this thing. I mean, I can see that as a very lucrative, um, you know, I find the problems and then, you know, I'm going to direct your IT and your, your security teams and your hospital teams to actually, you know, here's the, here's the plan to fix that. You know, here's all the things that I've outlined in this 500 page document. Here's the schedule and how you need to, to implement these things. So, I mean, is there, can do you have that kind of ability or is it like, you know, here's 500 pages of paper that you're, you know, paying me X number of dollars for. And I know that I'm going to be back writing, you know, just changing the date on the same report and the same shit's going to be coming back next year. I mean, that's got to feel kind of deflating for you, right? Yeah, it can. Um, but yeah, I got my start on the offensive side in pen testing and, you know, coming back year after year and doing exactly the same pen test. Um, there are some clients that are willing to write the check and not willing to make the changes. Um, and it's frustrating. And sometimes the most that you can hope for is, is that somebody is going to change or that there's going to be a change in personnel that is going to be willing to listen. Um, and you go in and you do it because if you don't, and they're just going to coast, then they have no idea. Right. Um, sometimes you go in and you just, you know, maybe somebody's going to read this report and realize that something needs to change. And, um, and then, and then you do come back and it's like, oh wait, this isn't, they closed off these, these three main paths that we've been doing the last two years, three years. Right. Um, okay. Something has actually finally changed and they, oh, well, yeah, you know, so-and-so read the report and, and you know, really realized that this has been that this has been a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and you see the same thing in the architecture reviews, uh, where usually you don't get one every year, but you know, you might come back a couple of years later and they ask you to do another one. <clears throat> and um you write it up and they well, wait, this looks a lot like your last one. It's like, well, yeah, it's because not much has changed. I mean, you, you handed over a bunch of policies and procedures that had exactly the same date. And when I talked to your people, your Windows servers are all being built by hand. None of them actually adhere to this automated process that you think is running. Um, you know, another thing that I've run into, um, uh, to give you something a little scarier, and I've run into this in more than one client, is that the, the incident response team does not know the incident response plan because it's been hidden from them. Oh, because... Wait, 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 wait. Why is the IR plan hidden from the IR team? Because if the IR team knows what the IR plan is and they get upset at the company, then they might be able to figure out a way to work around it. I'm I'm sorry. Wait, my my. What? So if if the IR team knew what was in the IR plan, they would try to work around it. Yeah. If if they were angry at the, if they were angry at their employer, that they could figure out a way of hacking the employer, so that the in a way that would not be a uh, that the IR plan could not respond to. And I have yeah. run into this at multiple locations. So they're so worried about insider threat from their own IR teams that mm -hmm. they don't. So who the hell's writing the IR plan then? Management. And, and, it, and, it, and they're typically, the, the IR plans are typically aimed more at how management is going to respond, which by the way, I don't mind that management has their own IR plan. I actually wish that more places would have a separate IR plan for management. It should mesh with the IR plan, the, the technical IR plan, but it shouldn't be the only one. Right. And it shouldn't, you also shouldn't have your management people for the most part trying to write the technical stuff. Um, you know, it's just, it's not their field. Um, right. But I, I've, I've mentioned before to some clients, um, you know, you, you don't wait, if, if you're a bank, you don't wait to train your tellers on how to deal with the holdup until there's a gun pointed at them. Right, right. You know, you train them ahead of time. And yes, you know, you might be training somebody on how to get around the holdup procedures, but the odds of that, the odds of the other uh, situation seem to be a lot stronger. And, right. um, yeah, it's just some you, you run into these things that just make no sense. And until you call it out, they they oftentimes don't realize it. Well, so the other the other idea, and I mean, we've gone a little far afield with the, the security assessment stuff, but it, this I'm finding this fascinating. So does so the management has an IR plan. Does the IR team have their own IR plan 
Or are they just waiting for kind something of. like a lock bit to happen at Lurie's Children's Hospital, and then they're just going to run around flailing their arms and screaming? Yeah. So what it, what ends up happening is is they have their sort of they have their own sort of impromptu. You know, we respond. Uh, we respond to these little virus outbreaks as needed, and they go in and they clean. Or if they're not sh- uh, sure if they can clean it out. Um, they'll just wipe the system and and reissue it. And um, but these are places that have never had to deal for the most part with a significant breach. Um, mm. You know that somebody gets into one app server. Okay, well they figure out how they get in and they close it off. Um, or like I said, a workstation gets hit by a virus, they reimage it, and they don't they don't go through exercises they don't go through tabletops um yeah they might was, actually that, give them training they, they might actually send them to training send us uh, sands or or whatever um which is good but they don't they end up not having an actual written procedure practiced uh periodically to determine whether it works and whether it's going to fit um they just yeah. sort of hope that they that the management one never has to get pulled out or if it does they figure that management's going to be able to run the thing Right. And um, that just often is not the case. Yeah, that that's nuts. Because my my next thought was, well, it's obvious they're not doing any tabletop exercises because then the IR team would know what's in the IR plan. But um, there, there's there's other there, you know there's specific and and when you said the management has an IR plan, the what I was guessing was it's very similar to how you're supposed to go back to paper and pencil, you know, instead of you know, or writing down what's going on and then you add it later in the EMRs or what have you, if it's been uploaded, um, not just the computer system. So I'm, I'm assuming, I'm hoping the IR teams at some of these hospitals have IR playbooks. Have you ever been to a hospital that's dealt with a major breach and have you noticed a difference between what happens post, you know, ransomware, you know, if they've been hit with the lock bits versus, you know, somebody who's up here in the clouds going, Oh, our hospital's safe. You know, we haven't been hit yet. You know, um, I haven't with any of uh, with any of the hospitals I've worked with for um, architecture reviews. Um, I without getting too far into things because there's that's only one. But um, I have been involved with a hospital where there was a pen test and um, the they dealt with a breach later on that I think would have been prevented had they been a little quicker on addressing the stuff with the pen test. They did seem to be a lot more interested in the results of the reports right uh after that um it's yeah there's there's a lot of places that just like well you know we haven't had to deal with it yet so we're just going to cross our fingers and hope that we never have to deal with it um and they kind of figure well there's you know x number of thousand hospitals in the country and there's only you know one or two getting hit each month but the thing is, is it's only one or two that you hear about right and eventually you're going to stop hearing about them because they become so common. Right. Oh God, that, oh, that, um, I just, that and makes my, my brain hurt. That makes my yeah, brain and, hurt. And I, I will tell you that I virtually always find out about these because I get told by the IR team that they don't know, that they've never seen the actual IR plan. And that's why in my mind, it is really important to not just, read over all the documents but to actually sit down and interview people right sit down right. with the sit down with the ir team sit down with the server admins i sit down i try to sit down with help desk and find out right. you know if they see if they see clues of that something doesn't feel right do they know what they're supposed to do and oftentimes it's just oh, i open a ticket and then i pass it on okay well if you just if you're getting a whole bunch of calls in that all sound like something is you know, there's some weird thing going on, then um, uh, you need to have a path over to security. And um, it, it's, there are just so many places that, that don't have things like that. They, it's just like, here's security, and then here's everything else, and um, we just, we do, all our security stuff is over here. And if security detects it, they work with it. And if anybody else detects it, well, we'll figure out some way of getting them to talk. Right. And so what's the, um, I I 
I, I don't. I, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have gone down this road with healthcare. But I, I'm just. It's a morbid fascination of mine. The the healthcare industry and education, which are the two most. At least every week, you see a school that's been popped, or you see a hospital that's been popped, or a bit of both. Uh, and it's 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 like. It must be like cloud cuckoo land over there, where everybody's just like, oh well, you know, we lived another day. We didn't get a ransomware or what have you. And, you know, we can't, you know, we don't have the budget for this because we have to put teachers in classrooms or, you know, we have to have doctors. So, you know, we can't invest in this box or, you know, make these decisions yet. They'll throw, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean this to sound negative, but they're going to throw money at you to tell them what's wrong and then not fix it because they think that that's going to fix the problem. And it, it, so when they bring you in, is this a compliance requirement usually? Sometimes. Or? Yes. So yeah, the, to get actually certified for that is really expensive and typically requires yeah. degrees that I don't have and, and stuff like that. But where I will often come in is the prep for that. You know, somebody knows that, that they need to, that they need to get some certification. Um, and they, they want me to come in and say, okay, well, you know, according to PCI, according to HIPAA, according to whichever, um, how close are we? And that can kind of get them on the road. Um, ideally, they are calling me like way before they need it. Right. <laughs> uh, I occasionally right. get a call. It's like, so we have we have a PCI guy coming in in three months. Can you come in and have a look at our network? I'm like, I'm. You're probably not going to get the stuff fixed by the time your your yeah, uh, exactly your guy shows up. But um, the uh, um, it's. It, it, it's something to keep in mind is that there are HIPAA auditors. There's no HIPAA certification. You you can't be right. HIPAA certified. You can comply with HIPAA, um, and that in that in itself is tricky. Um, the HIPAA, if you go back and you and you look through HIPAA, there are a few things that are concrete. If you're sharing health data, you have to have uh, you have a business you have to have to have a BAA, a business associate agreement. Um, and uh, there are a few other things, but it says you must encrypt your data. Okay. Right. Great. Um, I'm going to I'm going to encrypt it with uh, you know zip, whatever zips you know the the old old zip one, which I think was Des based. Right. And right. Um, okay, yeah, kind of. You're complying, but you're not really. Um, right. And for a while, uh, the federal government was sort of like, yeah, we'd really like you to fix this stuff and we'd really like you to use better practices and, and so forth. Um, and uh, I, I can tell you, I got a chance years ago to talk to somebody who was involved in in uh, drafting the actual regulations. And they told me that they really wish that they had been able to attach more teeth to it um, or, you know, tie right. it to tie it to uh, NIST uh, requirements. Um, right. And they just, they, they weren't sure that they could have actually gotten it passed. And uh, so they ended up with something that was much more ambiguous. Um, right. Over time, there have been, growing penalties and most of the penalties are still that i read about are still in the like 50 to 100 thousand dollar range um yep. those are typically against doctors offices it's enough to sting but it's not not enough to put them out of business there have been a few multi-million dollar ones um and there was one i, I haven't seen one similar to this but it was i think it was the first really really big fine and it was uh it was an emr company um that not only was the company fined, but uh, officers in the company and even individual developers were fined because their practices were so bad uh, that that they they felt that there was no way to actually get them to fix things unless everybody got hit. And they made a big story of, about it, and I think that woke a lot of people up. But um, there still isn't the kind of enforcement that. I think we need to see it in that. Yeah. As much as I understand the, the difficulty for hospitals and so forth, I, I still think that we need to see more strict enforcement and I think we need to see some updates to 
to uh, tie HIPAA compliance to uh, NIST or other standards. Yeah, I just posted up, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I just posted up an article that they just gave a, a declaration from the Office of Civil Rights for $4.75 million to a company called Montefiore Medical Center over HIPAA violations. Um, the investigation started in 2015, so it took them nearly 10 years yeah. to hit somebody with $4.75 million or hit hit the, the organization with that. One of its employees accessed 12,500 12, patient records uh, and sold that information to Identity Theft Ring. And they said over the next eight years, the investigation included significant HIPAA violations, including failure to conduct an accurate and thorough enterprise security risk analysis, which is... Something I'm sure that's why you come in to do uh, some of those yeah. things. <clears throat> yeah. uh, failure to implement procedures to regularly review information system activity logs, access reports, and security incident tracking, and failure to implement hardware, software, and or procedural mechanisms that record and examine activity of information systems that contain or use PHI. Um, yeah, so they... They agreed to conduct a thorough risk analysis, a methodology for which requires OCR's approval. So the OCR does have to, I think, for some of these more severe cases now, um, they they are going to have OCR crawling up their ass for the next you know, X number of years to make sure that they're doing the needful uh, there. But 12,500 people have now been opened up to potential identity theft because of this one yeah. employee. So, um, so okay. We, we've gone down a really deep rabbit hole, and I want to dig ourselves out of that. Yeah. So I want to go back to threats, because you mentioned, so far we've mentioned insider threat, we've mentioned nation states, and we've mentioned uh, things like lateral movement and those things. Those are, those are potential, well, lateral movement is a threat from an external actor or a nation state. Um, but um, when, when, you, when you come in and you do these analysis of these, these reviews, and uh, obviously... The threat model is part of it. You, um, I'm assuming you're using Stride uh, or something similar for your your threat methodologies when you go and do these, or do you have it, something specific that you've created? It depends. Um, a, a lot of times, the client will have a specific request. Um, PCI is a really common one. So, um, and I don't know. PCI is not what it needs to be. Uh, PCI-4 definitely has some improvements. It doesn't go far enough and it doesn't have enough teeth um, in large part because everybody's afraid of slicing big companies out of the market. But um, but that's, that's probably the most common one. HIPAA is probably the second most common one. And so what they're looking for is, you know, they, they're looking for more of a checkbox approach of you know, go through the different sections and how closely are we adhering to whatever these requirements are. Um, they're not, I, I, I've used Stride in the past. Um, it works to some degree. Um, if, if I'm coming in kind of blind, I don't always come in with a specific architecture because I need to find out where they're at. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's just getting some basic good practices into place. Mm. Um, the, things like asset management. Um, right. And, and I, I've been trying to use CSF a little bit more in this. I've also, in the past, I've used um, ISO 27002 um, as a bit of a checklist. That's a big one. Yeah, that's a and, big one. Um, it, it, it is. In some ways, it's simpler than using CSF because the number of um, – the breadth is similar – the number of controls, uh, the number of named controls is a little bit smaller. Um, and it's a little easier to kind of run down the checkbox and, and kind of hit, okay, which of these things are you actually doing? And which of these things do you have documentation for? And which of these things do, you, do your people actually know how they're supposed to be doing it? Um, once I've got that, then I can go into a deeper level. Um, and I've I've actually done some threat modeling under um, uh, um, um, um wow it's escaping me uh, trike and trike I think it's trike hold on um, um yeah so trike is an extraordinarily detailed threat modeling 
process where you are you don't want to do it for an entire environment but i right. have done trike for individual applications and you're keeping track of everything that moves inside an application um it, you're you're keeping track of the cookies that are moving around you're keeping track of the api tokens that are moving around you're keeping track of the data objects that are moving around right, and right. determining what can see it what can't who can touch it what the what processes can do different things with it right. um that's rare that that depth is required um but it's an option hmm. and um uh, yeah, I mean, you but, can get you can get pretty specific there. It's like down to per yeah. processor, or if you're, you know, doing things inside the system that's crunching numbers. It's like, do you have authenticated mechanisms for this system, you know, this process to, you know, hand off to this one, or you know, maybe you've got inter, you know, uh, encryption between processes because you know when the data comes in, it may be encrypted. This process does something with it and sends it to this one, but they may not encrypt it from process A to process B. So if yep. you can inject something between those two processes, uh, or in, you know, insert yourself, you know, host in the middle or you know, bad actor in the middle, you can sniff that traffic or sniff whatever came out of the process over here uh, and into some sort of potential readable format. So yeah, and when you get microservices architectures, it gets even trickier. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so when you go, so we mentioned nation state actors, you mentioned insider threat, which insider threat for a hospital, as we've seen with the example of the, 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 you know, the Montefiore, whatever healthcare center, uh, was a legit one. Um, when somebody says, Hey, you know, we're worried about China hacking us. What, what do you tell them? You tell them, is that, is that legit? Cause my whole thing is, you know, we, we've seen other stories about like, you know, Oh, you know, um, I think there was a story this week about post quantum encryption for iMessaging on Apple. And we got into it a little bit in our Slack channel. I was like, if you need post quantum encryption on your, Hey honey, go grab me some milk from the store. I think your threat model is you're not going to be using a phone. Um, so, you know, when, when somebody kind you know, when you come in and do a review and they're like, Oh, we're worried about China or whatever. Do you ever tell them, you know, you're, you're batshit crazy. You're not that important. Or do you actually just go ahead and go, mm -hmm, okay, yeah, China. Yeah. Well, you're already owned. So, you know, that, that is often a really difficult topic because they get worried. I, I don't hear about China so much uh, these days. I hear more about Russia. Um, sure. But sure. Um, they, they, so there were two, uh, there were two attacks that came along a couple of years ago about the same time. There's the solar winds hack. That was Russia. Right. Uh, where they, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with it, uh, uh, Russian hackers managed to get inside solar winds and modify the actual source code. Right. Um, and uh, the other one was the exchange vulnerability. Uh, I think it was the, I think it was an exchange webmail vulnerability um, that uh, allowed unauthenticated, you know, full unauthenticated access. Um, and when that was about to get closed up by the FBI, um, China apparently did like just this mass raid of every exchange server that was visible to the internet. And they just threw, um, they just downloaded everything that they could from anybody. Right. And the reality is that it didn't have to be China doing that. It could have been anybody doing that. So right. if you're right. not patching fast enough to fix that, um, it doesn't matter that it's China. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and there are a number of tools that are out there now that as soon as Microsoft or virtually anybody else releases a patch, um, there are there are tools that will try to put together an exploit against, you know, they'll look at the diffs between the patches uh, and they'll try yeah. to put together an exploit. And the exploit doesn't work right right there, but it it gives them a start. And sometimes we see exploits, you know, Microsoft releases at what, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and we see exploits yeah. out there by 11 or 12 o'clock. Right. Well, and, they have the, the bad guys have playbooks and they, you know, they've already pulled down the, the necessary files from someplace and they have, you know, exploded them and, you know, they can diff them. I mean, their playbook is very efficient because it's, Yep. They live or die by this, you know. If they don't, the first the first to use it is the free, you know, 
if, if you're five seconds late, your your competition, which is the other bad actors, are going to beat you to the punch. So, well, you have you have these companies that or you have these hacking groups that are effectively companies. They have they have paid subscription models, paid support, uh, and it's their job yep. to get the new exploit out and uh, and then they sell it. And it can be anybody. So right. you're not you're not necessarily protecting against nation states you are protecting against you know trying to protect against uh hacking groups that are pretty good but um if your if your basics aren't there it's not china or russia or whoever else that you really need to worry about yes they can get in but so can so many others right and they can bounce around for a while. And if, if you're not looking in the right place, and that's another thing, by the way, the architecture reviews can do is f figure out where are your actual blind spots. If you, you, know, mm. you can have whole sections of your network that there's no logging coming in, so you have no idea what's bouncing around there. And if you're not able to see any of that stuff, you're going to fall prey to just kind of the regular ones or even the script kitties. And the script kitties are probably going to come in and you're going to pick them up relatively quickly, but somebody with a just a little bit of skill and experience is going to know how to remain relatively quiet and they right. can st stick around in your network for days, weeks, months before you figure out that they're there. Right. Uh, and it's not hard if you're not logging anything, you don't get any alerts, nothing's going wrong. You know, you don't, uh, you, you don't, or, you, you don't know. No. Or if you're not paying attention to the logs or if you're getting too many logs, if you, you know, if right. your IDS is, if your IDS is looking for attacks against systems you don't even have, if you're a Windows shop, your IDS probably shouldn't be paying a whole lot of attention to the Linux attacks. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this is, um, yeah, the some of these industries, I, I don't want to say are ill-equipped. It's just there's a culture of, you know, not, I, I don't want to say not caring. It's just they, their priorities are completely business side and, um, I was talking with somebody the other day about ways to implement security that actually helps with productivity. And um, she actually mentioned a hospital and she said, you know, I was working with a hospital and we implemented MFA. And it actually caused an increase in productivity at the same time of implementing security because the doctors didn't have to you know, have a post-it note with their password on it or, you know, have to remember a password to log in every day. And it's like, oh, shit, what's my password? Oh, yeah, it's Chargers 97 or something like that. You know, having a badge where they could just tap and go increased productivity because they could do things a lot faster. And um, I think one of the other things she mentioned was, yeah, MFA for uh, VPN. So they could be more, you know, they could they didn't have to drive into the office to do their their notes or what have you, um, you know. I, it blew, I don't want to say it blew my mind, but it was it was awesome to hear somebody implementing security that was helping the business do better. Um, and I don't know if there's enough of that going on right now in our industry that we can say, okay, you know, you you know, if we can frame it as it's a productivity thing, it will help with productivity, it'll help with you know saving time and effort and what have you. I, I just don't know if we have enough examples of that in our industry to be able to to say that. I think we're getting there. Um, so I, I'll tell you a, a quick little story. Uh, a number of years ago, um, our youngest uh, was having some medical issues and we had to take him for a procedure. And <clears throat> um, the, the section of the medical center that we were in, um, it, you know, it was closed off to anybody except for patients and medical personnel. Mm -hmm. And I saw uh, one of the nurses came up and she logged into the computer at bedside with one of these tap cards. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I have never seen, you know, can you tell me about this? And she said, well, what we do is um, when we get to work, there's a station outside in the, the sort of general employee area. They log in there, they act, they tap their card, that activates it. And then when they're inside the, the patient area, any system that's there, they tap it and it logs and logs and logs them in on that station. They do whatever they need to. They log out and they go and they do whatever. And as long as they're in there, that card works and then on their way out they they tap the the logout station and then the card can't be used until they log back in and i was like Jeez. that is a brilliant approach of making it easy while still putting some barriers in place 
you have to have the right. card. And in order to activate the card, you have to know whatever other credentials. Now, I didn't get into, right. I didn't talk to her about anything more than like username and password. Um, that was the first time that I saw it. And then a couple years later, uh, I started seeing it in other healthcare facilities. Mm. And it has now become, it's become commonplace. I see it everywhere. Yeah. And um, I've moved a lot of my own uh, personal and work logins over to a YubiKey 5 um, using Fido. Yep. And, um, you know, I, I, I got the YubiKey 5, I plug it in. Now, I, I got the, uh, you know, I, I got to put in a passcode and I got to touch it. So I don't have the biometric right. one. Um, I would certainly consider biometric the next time around. Um, I just don't have the need to spend another 60 bucks on it. Um, yeah. But there's the NFC. I've got one yeah, too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with the NFC and, bit on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I haven't been able to get the NFC working, and that might just be my notebook. But um, the uh, and my desktop is is too old. But um, but that kind of thing it makes things. <laughs> yeah, I did exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, my phone does you does NFC. Why is this not working? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, I, I think there are groups that have really tried to look at this and try to figure out how do we not just make the security better, but also um, how do we make it easier for users? And I, I get into these discussions from time to time and, you know, people say, well, you're just moving the attack surface from one location to another. And I'm like, yeah, you're also making it narrow focused. Yes. Okay. Look, if, if, if I'm after Brian's, uh, if I'm after Brian's uh, credentials, and I know that he uses a biometric-based YubiKey. Yeah, I can hit him in the back of the head, throw him in the back of a van, take him wherever I need, and use his fingerprint on the YubiKey to log in. Great. The problem is, I had to approach you, I had to do something to get your YubiKey, and I had to do something to right. get your fingerprint. <clears throat> right. I have now raised the risk to myself as an attacker dramatically. Right. Um, and there are other ways of doing it, but it's just it's raising the difficulty and i don't have anywhere that i can go that i can just dump the entire password database and then right. use that to get in um or yeah. as we saw or as we saw uh, uh, this is actually kind of going a ways back but when um all the rsa uh, seeds the all the rsa device seeds got leaked um and suddenly all the rsa devices you know if you knew what the serial number was and the seed hadn't been changed somehow uh you had the MFA for, for your target. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I work a lot with people who deal with risks at work and <clears throat> we've had a couple of meetings, I don't know, gone 90 minutes or so because of, and I'm going to keep this fairly generic because I like working at my job and making money and, and being able to eat food and stuff. We'll talk about a problem that, that exists in, in the organization and or we'll get something from you know bug bounty program or something like that, and the and, and you know the researchers like oh this is the worst thing next to sliced bread you know you're you're already owned up just give me all the monies right now because I've just showed you how to be completely owned and you you read through the write up and you realize okay one um, you can't do this from everywhere in the world you have to be literally down the street from somebody if it's a wireless kind of thing or if it's a you know, if it's a Bluetooth kind of thing or, you know, people who go to Vegas are like, oh, you got to get a burner phone or whatever. If you get somebody close enough that they can actually physically touch you, you're going to know it. You know, I've, I've been in hotels and stuff and I've been in fairly close quarters. If somebody bumps into you, you know it. Or if somebody, you know, if somebody tries to be sneaky and wants to go and try to scan your phone by touching your, your phone or whatever, you're going to know it. So you know, some of the, some of the write-ups we get from researchers are kind of funny and it's like, okay, I have to literally be parked in front of your house doing a certain thing while you're doing a certain thing at the exact same time you're doing this other thing. And I'm like, this is not a bad thing. This is so focused that it can't possibly be a critical issue or, Hey, I've completely owned you. What you've done is you've set up a lab where you can recreate that thing yourself and it's all safe and everything. In the real world, that doesn't happen. You know, and and, and I and I see this internally sometimes with folks who are like, oh, well, you know, if somebody did X, Y, and Z, they could do this. I'm like, yeah. 
they can't do that from, you know, if they're in Thailand and I'm in San Diego, California, they cannot own me with that vulnerability. They have to be sitting in my driveway doing that thing. Or they have to be, you know, the the, um, the CVSS scores is, you know, do you, can, you know they, they, they've added the adjacent bit, which I love. It's like you either be on the same network or you be in proximity to that network to be able to do something. I'm like, you're, you have to literally be on that person's network. So you have to hack their Wi-Fi. You have to know their password. You have to be literally in their house or something like that. And I'm like, the minute you can't go from Thailand to San Diego, California, and not sitting in my in my driveway, it's not a critical. It's not a critical issue. Or it's like it's a device. And I'm like, oh, you know, I've got a critical issue on this device. And I'm like, yeah, that's because you were able to pop the plastic off of it and dump the firmware. Of course you found the vulnerability that way. You know, these are these are not crit once you've had physical access to any kind of box, it's game over. You know, th those are not yeah. criticals. Those are, you know, that takes skill. And I'm, I, I use the skill thing because anybody can crack a box open. But, you know, dumping firmware is not easy. You have to know how to solder and stuff. And de depending, you know, I know some of you are like, oh, I can solder. A good majority of America can't solder for shit, you know. And they don't understand the pinouts on a, a UART board. And, you know, they don't have the, the capability and the tech, you know, the, the, the tools with which to do this. One, that's also a dedicated attacker. That is somebody who has a goal in mind, not just Joe Dogwalker, who is like, well, I just want to crack open my device and do something with it. And it's like, these are not critical issues because it's not a determined attacker. Joe, Joe Nobody's not going to come into somebody's house at a dinner party, crack open a device or crack open a, a thing or leave something there. Typically, you would think. I just have a real problem sometimes with the way we assess risk from a security point of view. We're always, I don't know if we're trying to emulate what we would do. Like, oh, if I want to go to a dinner party, I'm going to leave something at the dinner party. It's like, who does that shit, you know? So I, I really have a problem sometimes with how we assess risk in terms of reality versus reality. You know, in, in security land, everybody's leaving, you know, you know, corrupted poison apple thumb drives and, you know, dropping, you know, O day and in you know at dinner parties and stuff and I just I just find it crazy sometimes what the way we communicate risk and it really comes off as paranoid and stupid uh, mm -hmm. in in many cases so sorry for the rant yeah there, but no no I, I I fully agree with you we get we get way too wrapped up in our own stuff and I, I mean I used to be there I used, I used to be I read a report about something like okay how do how can we protect the entire multinational company from this. We don't need to protect the entire multinational company from this. We need to isolate, or we need to identify a few key people, and determine right. how are we going to protect them. You know, I mean, there was um, right. So thinking thinking about a couple of things, uh, and again, some of these are, are years ago. Uh, there was uh, a CEO, and I want to, I it was a, I, I I'm not going to name it because I might be wrong, but there was it was a chip manufacturing CEO who was giving a talk at a conference and stepped away from his notebook that he had on the podium for like 30 seconds and he came back and the notebook was gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding was that ultimately they they realized that they probably should have the executives uh, hard drives encrypted too. Ah, um, yes. But they didn't <clears throat> because the executives didn't like it because you know they okay. had to remember the pass key to get in and, and whatever and i mean th this is still oh, a problem okay. this day not n not as much fortunately executives right, are taking right, things right. a lot more seriously but um you know there are people that if if the notebook goes missing you lop it off and you don't let it access and it can be dangerous i'm not saying don't encrypt don't get me wrong right. but you you need to look and see what the actual threat uh, is if one of those notebooks goes wandering. Um, same thing on um, same thing on, on like wireless networks. Um, if your wireless networks are structured correctly, you know one of the things that I've been pushing for a long time is if you're going to put up a guest network, fine, make it separate from the rest of your stuff, or at least right. set everything so that it can never anything on it can never jump the gap. Now, yes, you can potentially exploit the the infrastructure, but that's really, really rare. And just make it so that nothing can ever jump the gap. 
and I'm not worried about weirdos getting on as long as you've got decent protection on there and web filtering and so forth. Um, but some people get really paranoid about how to protect their guest networks, and it ends up being really frustrating. Um, it ends up being really frustrating for visitors, and I've run into this periodically. So, oh, well, you know, we we got to go contact Alice for the password, but Alice isn't here today, and Bob's the backup, but Bob's in a meeting for four hours, and so you can't, you don't get access to the network. Right. Okay, well, right. I can, you know, I can get on my phone as a hotspot, great, but if there's something that I need off of your network, now we get, now we get a sneaker net it. Um, the, um, there are other cases though, where I think we do need to be careful. And, uh, one of them is international travel. Right. Um, if you are taking any company property over borders, you are running into a very, very different threat risk because, um, any of those countries can take anything that you have brought in and they can take it into another room that you have no idea what they're doing. All right. So if, yeah. if that is the case, take a burner phone, take a burner note. Right. If they ever leave your site, you don't use them for the rest of the trip. You figure out another way of doing things or you just don't do stuff. Yeah. Um, and this is going to depend on the countries that you go to, but um, it's, it's worth talking to an international attorney um, and saying, okay, you know, what are the risks? If I go to this country or that country, what are the risks of, um, of you know, if something's taken, what what are my rights? And right. it can be really surprising. We have, there are countries that are friendly to the United States that you have zero right, uh, you know, until you're actually in there. Yeah, you have your visa, great. But as far exactly. as the stuff that you're bringing in, until they sign it off, you know, it's borderline theirs. And um, you don't know what's going on. And if for whatever reason you're a target, eh. Yeah. So, you know, it, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's long odds on that kind of thing. But that is, that is something where you should be thinking about that kind of thing. Right. And you can definitely go to places like, you know, State Department to get, right. you know, um, travel warnings or, you know, things to do yep. about that. There's, there's definitely resources out there. And, and technically, if, you're, if your security or your, your company does any kind of international travel or allows for international kind of travel, they should have some kind of policy or process or procedure for, you know, doing that properly, including things like MDM on your, on your devices. In that case, you know, for that yeah. kind of thing, MDM is definitely something you'd want to do uh, where you can, you know, call up IT and go brick that box now and they can, they can brick it for you. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've advised if, if you're traveling, you take a notebook that has nothing on it at all. Right. That VPNs back and you remote desktop into whatever. And so everything you're doing is still back at home. Right. You can show the stuff on the right. screen. Great. But if the, if the notebook gets taken, if it gets stolen, if it gets lost, you there's nothing, there's no data on it to actually worry about. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And I think that's, I, I, I think that's why people kind of treat DEF CON and Black Hat similarly. It's um, they, they consider it to be a super hostile network, but you know, I, the, the I have found at those conferences, unless you're doing things like the CTF, sometimes there's not even a need to take a laptop with you. Um, you know, the the less security or less electronic footprint you've got, probably the better in those cases. And you can do most everything on your phone. Um, yep. Yeah, which if you really feel like you need a burner phone, yeah, go and get one. It's your money, not mine. But you know, it's it it, it again goes back to that thing where you're going to look nuts by saying, "Hey, I got to go to Vegas and I have to have a burner phone and a burner laptop." It's it's uh, you know, if your threat model is such that you're worried that somebody's going to you know hack your stuff, maybe you shouldn't have that there. Um, yep. You know, I go back to the post quantum you know eye messaging stuff. It's like if you need post quantum encryption, you're not going to be using a phone. You're going to be flying yeah. and delivering those messages or, you know, you, you're, you're going to be, you know, you probably won't be using iMessage. You probably are using things like WhatsApp or ephemeral messaging or something like that. So. Yeah. And w real quick on the, the post quantum thing, it's good that that's being worked on, but I think people sure. have a really, have a really limited understanding of what the risks are. Um, to my knowledge, uh, and it's been a few months since I've looked into it, but I don't think it's changed in that. Um, to my knowledge, there is no quantum computer on the horizon 
that is going to suddenly make AES-256 just done. You know, that yeah. it's just cracked. Um, my understanding is that it roughly has the effective key size. So AES-128 right. becomes 64-bit, and that's a problem. AES-256 effectively becomes 128. Right. That's not a problem. Right. It's really not. Not not yet. Um, not yet. Give it give it no, time. No, not yet. Give it time. And and I understand the the quantum stuff they're trying to do things like perfect forward secrecy. So, you know, if you're sending nudes of yourself to your, you know, your significant other or if you're sending messages that could get encrypt, you know, decrypted later. I, I completely understand that attack frame where it's like in 10 years what I'm sending now may lead me to have to go testify in front of Congress or something. I completely understand that. But like the majority of people sending messages out there is just like, you know, cat memes and, you know, lol and hey, go grab a, you know, a, a, a bag of hot dogs at the at the, the, the supermarket. It's like if you're going to send messages that you know need to be post quantum or, you know, perfect forward secrecy or completely encrypted and even ephemeral, I would ephemeral is probably the best bad encrypted and ephemeral. So that way it disappears and you never see it again. Um, you're going to you're going to make the you're going to take the steps to make that happen it's not going to be like oh you know and and maybe this is you know you want to do all everything because you're going to slip up one time and you're going to do that i completely understand but there's a certain threat model for everybody and it, if it, if it requires you to have those kinds of controls in place then you're you're going to you're going to be living a certain way you're not going to be you know um you're going to be living that life, not, you know, like, oh, today I'm just going to wake up and start using post-quantum encryption. It's like, you know, you got to have a reason to kind of want to implement those things. So, anywho, anywho, oh my there's goodness, a, we have we have talked a long time. Sorry, you said there's a what? Yeah, so there's a, um, I'm looking it up so you can, so you can throw it out there. Uh, there is a threat model that Google did. So a few years ago, Google was trying to figure out how to do end-to-end -end encryption in the browser. And they they open sourced it, um, and wow, it's been almost ten years. Um, but they wrote up a they included a threat model um, in the they included a threat model in the um, in the wiki on the GitHub. Got it. And yep. um, it is one of the best examples that I have seen of a very readable and fairly complete by their own admission uh, uh, threat model where they go through and they identify all the potential issues and, and in some cases, some potential fixes. But there's also a list of things that is down towards the end of other threats. Compromised through browser debugging APIs. Can't do anything about it. Backdoor and end-to-end -end source code. Can't, well, they can do a little bit about it, but it's hard. Denial of service. <laughs> nothing, they, nothing they can do about it. Flaws in cryptographic algorithms. There's not a whole lot that they can do about that. Um, it is, it's really readable. It's moderately long, um, but it, this is a good threat model for a focused application. If you if you have one platform and you're doing a threat model, this is an excellent example of how to, of how to do it. going through uh, the assets, going through the potential threats, going through the, the risks, the, the whatever fixes can be done. They ultimately they got to the end of this and they went, we can't make this work to a level that we're happy with, but we're going to open source it to see if somebody else can figure out some ways of doing it. Right. Um, right. And I'm really happy that they that that open sourcing included this threat model because it's it's wonderfully done. Even ten years later, I go back and I look at it and I like I I, I wish I could see much much more out there like this. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. So I guess the the last thing I want to ask about is you know. What tool, if you could tell a company, hey, you know, this is a good tool for security architecture? I know, I know the quite the answer is probably Visio, but it's got awful and it's locked into things. So, is there a tool that you could use that isn't Visio that does really good security architecture diagrams? Whiteboard. Just get whiteboard. a whiteboard. Get a whiteboard and start and start putting it up there. And um, I, I mean, it sounds. It sounds no, no, really no, no, crazily no. simple, but yeah. I, I And sit down, get everybody in the same room, sit down and diagram your network and the data flows. Once you've got that, there are, you can do draw.io. Um, 
set up a local think, instance, yeah. please. Uh, but you can you can do it in Visio. There, there's a ton of platforms out there that will do this, that will do just fine in it. And document where all of your all of your data is going. You don't have to know every one of your assets in there. You need you know, group your databases, group your application <clears> servers. <throat> it doesn't matter if you have one or two or ten. Just group them. Right. Um, as long as they're all doing the same thing. Um, and that will get you a view of things that is enormously valuable. And it's not going to be perfect the first time. You're going to get it all documented and somebody's going to come in and say, well, wait, 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 we forgot about this stuff over here. Great. Mm. Put it up on the whiteboard, make it look good, add it into the document. Right. Right. Those data flows will give you more information at least from a paperwork basis, they will give you more information quicker than anything else that you can do. And actually, I, I would say they are invaluable to new employees that are coming on because if they can open up the document and they can see where the data is at least supposed to be going rather than trying to go through all the different configurations and trying to figure out what goes where and they might not have access to all the stuff that they need to understand it. Um, it is just absolutely invaluable. And by the way, if you're in the middle of an incident and you pull that data flow diagram out, you can start figuring out what can we start blocking off safely uh, without compromising the rest of the network. Right, right. And um, with, without compromising the operations for the rest of the network, you know, shutting down the, too much of the network. Yep, yep. So one of the one of the things that I've started using for my own uh, side projects and stuff is Microsoft Whiteboard, uh, which is behind an authentication and authorization, you know, it's in, in your M365, it's, it, you know, it's powered by Azure, it's all this stuff. They don't, they're not paying for me to, you know, pimp out their products, okay? <laughs> so, you know, don't worry, Twitch and, and YouTubers, but um, it's collaborative as well. So it's like a Google Docs, but, you know, people can log in and, and, and view these things on the fly and update everything. I've gotten, and it, it's like an infinite, you know, in infinite uh, size. So you can keep building and building and growing and growing it. So you can put things like documents inside of it. It can get pretty wieldy, um, but I've I've actually used it to great effect uh, for, for diagramming on the cheap. Uh, as long as, you know, stylus helps, but it does have the ability to draw, uh, you know, um, those things. Um, but yeah, yeah if, if you if you got people working from home or if you got people in other offices, by all means, use a shared whiteboard, but um, just my experience has always been there's nothing easier than just grabbing a pen and starting to write. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the Leviathan, when I sent you there, the blog on threat modeling, uh, my friend, Dr. Cowan, actually that's, that was his, uh, so for the, uh, I, I'll post it up in here too, but, um, uh, it got po the whiteboard that he is doing his threat model on that you see in the blog post from the Leviathan is actually sitting next to his desk in his office, but it's it's a crude example, but it's exactly what you you suggested. So when you said, "Oh yeah, just sit down with a whiteboard," I started laughing because I was like, oh, "That's exactly what Chris was doing." <laughs> He's like, "Sit down and start mapping out where everything is." And his his thing was he kept adding like different roles. So you know, different roles in an in an architecture diagram. You know, a regular user will use it this way, and there's a different data flow for that. And you know, different functionality may be had from different uh, orgs. So um, you know, depending on what kind of system it is, if it's an entire platform or if it's an application, you know, you're gonna you're gonna need to tailor those things accordingly. Um, which you know we didn't get to, but we definitely should you know maybe schedule something else in the future to talk about different. You know, you know, the differences between like a, a device pin, you know, threat model versus an app threat model versus a platform threat model versus an enterprise threat model, because they can't they're all different and they can ju get just as wieldy, even though app feels like it might be very microcosm of the enterprise. It has its own quantum world as well, where it's, you know, little pieces inside of it and a lot of moving yeah, parts. Yeah. W when it comes to the apps. I, it, they are they are deceptively large threat models. I mean, even when you get the um, the uh, uh, blanking out of the uh, essentially the compiled web apps, mm, um, yeah. yeah, and there there are companies that look at those and say, well, it's it's just this little tiny thing, and it just has this little bit of functionality. And I'm like, yeah, but it's connecting to your web server that has all <laughs> that other functionality, right? You know, and because it doesn't have any limits on its own. 
it can throw whatever API stuff at your web server and, you know, yep. you don't have any local control. Now, that's not to say that an attacker isn't going to spoof it and throw whatever they want to at it anyway. Yeah. But, um, yep. you know, you, you're relying on your server side control, which you should have. Right. Um, <clears throat> You know, if 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 it's supposed to be an integer coming in, make sure it's an integer before you pass it on to the, the application code. Right. Um, right. And plus, you know, you have eight hundred modules that you've called in your Python script there for your your fancy you know web app thing. So, you know, your threat model can include things like you know library dependencies and you know build information, you know, SBOM related yeah. items as part of your 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 threat model and it's like oh we've got huawei stuff in here okay you shouldn't have the huawei stuff you're gonna have to rip that out so yeah, yeah. I, I laugh every time i go to i go to install a, like one little python thing and it's just like great you need these 73 other modules i'm like oh that's why I, that's, i'm installing it i'm installing a i'm installing a you know 300k python thing why do i need all these modules you're installing an operating system uh, to run a script <sighs> yeah yeah so yeah well, you know, um, I'd love to keep talking to you. It's ten fifteen your time, and I know that you're, you know, you've got, you know, I, I'm glad you were able to put your 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 family to bed uh, before you you came on with me. But um, uh, and I'm sorry, Mr. Betcher, and Mr. Berlin couldn't make it because I, I know they'd love to have seen you. So, um, oh, um, what's the name of your company again? So my company name is Illuminus. I L L U M I N U S. Uh, and you can reach my website at illuminous.com. Um, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, I've posted that in our chat a couple times. Illuminous.com. Illuminating the dark corners of your network. Indeed. Do you have a tool? Because usually people have tools. Uh, I don't have anything that I've written myself. Uh, That's good. Aside from a few... Aside from a few handy scripts here and there but um and wrong with that and wrong with that so um cool and um yeah are you going to be speaking or uh you know attending any conferences in the near future um for reasons uh, attending conferences is tricky for me um i i do occasionally put out feelers uh for for doing talks i don't have anything on the schedule at this point but uh i'll let you know if anything comes up okay all right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so you can um, find, you know, Jared on his LinkedIn profile, which uh, you can just go look for Jared Freitas, J-A-R-R-O-D-F-R-A-T-E-S. Um, he's not, not hard to find. I post, yeah, I posted him up in our in our uh, LinkedIn chat. So uh, and uh, yeah, that was, you know, that was awesome. So Miss Berlin, of course, is not here, but she's a big fan of you. Know, oh, not not. I, t I I wore that shirt earlier today. So she's a mental health hackers uh, um, a member uh, and founder, and uh, she is uh, on inf on Twitter at InfoSister, I N F O S Y S T I R, uh, and uh, you can find her on LinkedIn as well. She's doing a lot of posts for Blue Mirror over there. Uh, Mr. Betcher, you can find him at Betcher Pwned, B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. And uh, you can join our Discord if you go to discord.gg forward slash uh, Discord. Wait, 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 wait. It's been a long day for me. Discord. I can't even type. Discord. There we go. Uh, yeah, Discord for, uh, gg, dot gg forward slash breaksec. That's our invite to our Discord. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of people on there, a lot of uh, good discussion going on down over there. Um, I can be found at Brian Brake on Twitter, and uh, you can find me. I'm Brian Brake on LinkedIn, so I'm not hard to find. And uh, we're a proud sponsor of B-Side San Diego. So we're a bronze uh, sponsor. We're going to be at B-Side San Diego, we're being me. Um, I'm also going to be gooning at that, so I'll be running security for that uh, as well. Help it, not running it. I'll be helping with security at the event. Um, but we're a proud sponsor of that, and th it's this thanks to you. Listeners, Patreon supporters, Twitch followers, everybody. So um, thank you very much for that. And thank you for helping B-Sides, uh, the America's finest B-Sides is what they call themselves. So um, y'all got B-Sides Dallas, right? B-Sides Dallas and Austin and San Antonio? Uh, we have, yeah, we had, well, there's B-Sides DFW, um, DFW. And that is in, that's uh, usually the first weekend in November. Okay. And do, do you still have B-Sides Fort Worth? Don't they have a, don't they have one as well? 
don't think so. I could be wrong. I I, I yeah, tend I... to kind of stick in my my own neighborhood over here. But B-Sides yeah. DFW is, is uh, usually November. I haven't gotten down to B-Sides Austin. Uh, and I, I think they're coming up in a few months. Uh-huh. I think oh, okay. they're usually so they springish. Did... Yeah, yeah. That, um, yeah, B-Sides Austin. B-Sides Austin. Oh, I don't see B. Oh, no, not Sides Austin. B-Sides Austin. There we go. <laughs> Sides Austin gave me all barbecue stuff, and I was like, "What the hell?" Um, well, that's yeah, not 20, bad. It says uh, December fifth and sixth. Wow, so they moved oh. it. Wowzers! I could be wrong. Yeah. Maybe they're normally December. I, I was thinking that they were usually in the spring. Yeah, no, they just they had theirs in December. Yeah, they had theirs in December, so they're they've got another whole ten months. Wow. Okay. Crazy. Anyway, well, Jared, it was that's... great to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad you're able to take time. Um, and if uh, folks need a security review or some architecture review or, you know, an audit of their hospital or K-12 education center, um, hit up, hit up Jared and, uh, he'll, he'll get you set straight or he'll give you a 500 page document that you won't use and he'll come <laughs> back the next year and just change the date anyway. So it's, it, uh, it's not going to be 500 pages. I think, I think the longest one I've ever written is 60 pages. I'm sorry. And yes, they, lengthy so, lengthy reports are not good. Yeah, you want usually you know, usually they're in the neighborhood stuff. of thirty to forty pages. That's good. That's awesome. All right, very nice. Well, um, that's it for breaking down uh, breaking breaksec podcast, breaksec ed, breaksec uh, uh, Twitch stream. Hope everyone had a, a good time. Uh, thank you to everybody who showed up. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for uh, letting us know about the stream. I'll put the more complete stream up later. Cybercoster on Twitch, Digital Warhead, some of the other regulars. So appreciate y'all for coming. So uh, hello to the is, regulars. Goodbye yes. to the regulars. Well, you know, Jerry, you can if you want to come on our Tuesday or Friday streams, you, you're more than welcome to you know come on and you know talk. Uh, I'll I'll, meant, I'll try to you know hit the hit the YouTube uh, chat a little more often because sometimes I'll see them after you've streamed. I'm like oh, after I'm sure I'm like oh man okay <laughs> yeah, sorry man sorry I'm usually cook, I'm um, usually cooking dinner for the kids so. Uh, oh, okay. But yeah, we'll that's figure cool. something out. Right on. All right. Well, that's it for the the show this week. Uh, take care. Stay warm. Stay safe. Uh, you know, reach out if you need some help. And uh, as we're fond of saying here, uh, take care of yourself because you're the only you you have. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye, y'all.